Okay, so I am uh, C.R. Pradeep, uh, uh, teaching at uh, Chennai Bhaswara Institute Technology at Gubi. Uh, today we will continue our study of uh, complex analysis. I will uh, explain uh, this theorem of Cauchy, its proof, and some of its consequences. Uh, so let me, I have made a small PPT. I will try to share that with you so that we all can understand it better. So today I'm going to teach uh, Cauchy's theorem. Mm. This is probably the most important theorem you will study in complex analysis. It's extremely useful, very basic. Uh, before I state Cauchy's theorem, let me recall what we have done before. What we have done before is that if I have a complex valued function or in a region, a continuous one, means the function must be continuous. Uh, if I have such a function and if there is a path in that region, we have already seen what it means to say to integrate this function along this path. Of course, in your PUC, your pre-university courses, you have done this for real valued function, how to integrate real valued function. Uh, now we have also learned, even if it is complex valued function, how to integrate these functions over a path. That's what we have done along a path. Uh, the function, complex valued function was only a continuous function. Now I impose this extra condition of analyticity. Uh, you have already seen in the previous module what analytic, analyticity means. Essentially, you know, I must have, it must have a power series representation or you must have learned it by saying that uh, whichever direction I come approach a point, the derivative must be the same. Essentially, that's what you must have learned. Mm, so we will impose the analyticity condition on my function. Then I want to see what happens to <coughs> the integral for special paths. That's what I want to do. And uh, some preliminaries before I start with the statement of the theorem. Uh, you recall that a curve in complex plane is nothing but a mapping from the unit interval i to the complex plane. That means you take any map. Essentially, it means you draw a curve in complex plane. So where you start drawing a curve, that is image of zero, where you end drawing the curve, that is image of one, zero to one. So I'll show you some figures soon. And I'll say curve is closed if, start, if the starting and ending points are the same. And I'll say curve is simple if the curve does not intersect itself. I know it's a, maybe a bit abstract, I'll show you examples. This is a curve. As you can see, this is complex plane, this whole thing. And you see a blue line here. This is a curve. Essentially, this is f of 0, f of 0.1, f of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, f of 0.5, etc., 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 up to f of 1. So this is a curve. It's a function from unit interval to complex plane. It could be a straight curve. It could be any curve. It's there's nothing particular about its shape. Now I want to impose conditions on its shape. For example, this is a closed curve, which means I start somewhere. I go around, go, 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 so various points on the complex plane and come back to wherever I started. This is a closed curve. This means f of zero is equal to f of one. These kind of things we have studied before. I'm just trying to be quickly re recalling these concepts for you. So we understand what are the closed curve. Basically, the start initial and ending points must be the same. And we have also seen, probably this you have not seen, but I'll recall. No, this also you must have seen in your vectors uh, chapter. This is a simple closed curve. But essentially, this curve does not intersect with itself. You see here in this function, this curve, the curve is intersecting itself at two points. This is one point where it's intersecting. This is another point where it is intersecting with itself. In this curve, the curve never intersects with itself. It starts at some point, goes round and comes back to the original point and never intersect itself before. 
such a thing is called a simple closed curve even at times it's also called a loop but i will prefer to use this word simple closed curve so uh, i hope it's clear what is a simple closed curve essentially it's a curve which starts at a point and comes back to the same point without intersecting itself any time uh so this is a so even before i state uh, statement of cauchy's theorem uh, some more pictures are in order this is complex plane you can see the real uh, sorry this is the real axis this is the complex axis uh, imaginary axis and then here is a region r these are standard notations i'll keep using all through my lectures r is a region in the complex plane in this figure i have shown as if it's in the first quadrant but there is no such restriction it could be anywhere <clears throat> and f is an analytic function on r this is a picture you must keep in your mind all through my lectures here is a region in complex plane and there is a function this is a complex valued function uh, means f of any complex number answer is going to be a complex number means f of say for example this point whatever 4 plus 5i uh, f of 4 plus 5i is a complex number here will be another number 3 plus 4i f of 3 plus 4i will be a complex number like that you take any point in this region r i can give i can associate a complex number with that so if you start with a point z f of z is the complex valued function and i want it to be analytic analytic you already seen the definition uh, basically derivative all derivatives must be equal i mean all derivatives must derivative there is only one but you approach that point from whichever direction the derivative must be the same that limit must be the same so uh, such a thing i'll call analytic function there are many uh, characterizations of analytic functions we will use just this and one of the most important things we know about analytic functions is cauchy riemann it may analytic functions satisfy cauchy riemann equations so <clears throat> picture for us is that we have a complex plane we have a region in the complex plane there is a function complex valued function which is analytic in r then i will consider a simple closed curve in r i just told you what a simple closed curve is it's a curve which starts at some point and comes back to the same point without intersecting itself think of a rubber band one single rubber band that is what a simple closed curve is so this function is defined everywhere here on this path it's a loop actually it's a simple closed curve it's a path of course so along this path f is defined i can talk of integral of f along this path because i know how to integrate any function along the path now additional uh, condition is that f is analytic all over here then cauchy told us that the integral of f along c is zero if my f is analytic everywhere here everywhere in my r and if c is a closed simple closed curve in r then integral of f of z over c is zero that is what cauchy's theorem says here is the statement uh, it says if f of z is analytic at all points inside and on a simple closed curve actually it doesn't have to be everywhere in the region just wherever the simple closed curve is with inside that of course this assumes that you know that you draw any simple closed curve it breaks the plane into two parts one inside and one outside uh, this requires a proof but anyway we won't bother about such things there are things known as jordan curve theorem and things like that we won't bother about it uh, basically we have a, a simple closed curve a loop it has an inside and an outside inside and on c i want my f to be analytic that's what it means to say f is analytic at all points inside and on a simple closed curve then what it says is that um, uh, the integral of f along c is zero that's what cauchy's theorem says proof of cauchy's theorem uh, normally mm, i don't know i don't uh, means even though i like the proofs i don't give too many proofs for these set of lectures but anyway here i'll uh, try to tell mm, proof of uh, cauchy's theorem is very, pretty straightforward and simple it uses basically analyticity of f i know f is analytic that's what i told you f this uh, function is analytic in inside and on the simple closed curve c and 
it uses the fact that it is analytic and uh, so what does it use about it being analytic it uses essentially cauchy riemann equations the proof it also uses green's theorem uh, green's theorem what does it say green's theorem essentially says uh, i'll tell you the precise details what it says is if you have if you are integrating something along a simple closed curve along a path along a closed curve then it co converts this real integral into a, a, a integral double integral or integration integral over this region inside i'll tell you the precise statement of green's theorem so remember green's theorem says converts integral along a path along a boundary to an integral inside the region so these are the two things which it uses so green's theorem, so proof of cauchy's theorem essentially uses analyticity of f in the form of cauchy riemann equations and green's theorem which converts an integral along a path into a surface integral in a region so here we go i'll tell you the proof for so proof of what <clears throat> proof of this fact that integral of f of z dz is zero this is what i want to prove integral of f z dz along this curve c is zero is what i want to prove so i'll start with let's say f f of z is u plus iv usual notations u is the real part of the function v is the complex part of the function and the integral of f of z is uh, f of z dz dz means x is uh, z is x plus iy so dz will be dx plus i dy u uh, plus iv is fz so fz is u plus iv dz is dx plus i dy and all this integration is along the curve c this is the definition we have seen it before uh, <clears throat> so you rewrite this u dx you multiply this u dx plus u i dy plus i v dx minus rather plus i square v dy so you evaluate this i'll get u dx minus v dy i square is minus 1 plus i times so i'm breaking up this integral into uh, two integrals one real and one both are real integrals but uh, one real integral is multiplied by a complex number basically expand this brackets that's all this is the definition we have seen this before so i'll call this first integral i1 and the second integral i2 so uh, i want to prove this is equal to zero this i1 plus i i2 is zero this is a bad notation i here and i here but i hope you understand this capital i1 is the first integral capital i2 is the second integral small i is the complex number i so <clears throat> i want to prove this is equal to zero when c is a closed simple curve simple closed curve that's what i want to prove so uh, recall what green's theorem says green's theorem says if you have an integral of this form basically it's a similar uh, situation is similar to what we saw in this figure uh, this figure says so i have a function which i want to integrate along this path i will convert it to real integral then integral along this path is converted to integral along this region how it is converted that is precisely the green's theorem so here is green's theorem if i have a real integral integral along the boundary curve m dx plus n dy this is equal to integral along the region d is that region inside the simple closed curve uh, double integral of del n by del x minus del m by del y n is what so how do i get this n n is del n by del x where n is coefficient of dy and m is coefficient of dx this is how i get m and recall m and n are functions of x and y both uh, so i can talk of del m by del x del m by del y etc etc this is uh, green's theorem so this you have seen it uh, earlier uh we will use this here in this case uh, i1 uh, see uh, recall i1 is basically u dx minus v dy in this if i want to apply green's theorem m is equal to u and n is equal to minus v so m equal to u n equal to v see here m dx plus n dy 
this i1 only i am talking i2 i'll do it later again so i1 says m dx plus n dy where m is u and n is minus v that's what i'm trying to do in that case m dx plus n dy is equal to minus del n by del x not minus del n by del x minus del m by del y m is equal to minus v n is equal to minus v and m is equal to u you use this uh, means you converted uh, the path integral i1 to a double integral by green's theorem of course you have to integrate along dx dy uh, but by cauchy riemann equation it says this is zero the by cauchy riemann equation says del u by del y is equal to del v by del x uh, that's cauchy riemann equations which i got it because f is a uh, holomorphic function uh, means analytic function so del u by del y is equal to del v by del x so this will become zero by cauchy riemann equation if this is zero double integral is zero so i1 is zero similarly i2 is also zero in i2 what happens uh, you see i2 m is equal to v and n is equal to u in green's theorem m is equal to v and n equal to u this means del this is what it is del u by del x minus del v by del y use green's theorem for i2 separately use green's theorem for i1 and i2 separately and uh, by cauchy riemann equation del u by del x is equal to del v by del y so this becomes zero so i2 is also zero uh, then uh, integral of f of z which is i1 plus i i2 is zero so proof of cauchy's theorem is triviality i mean not trivial but it's very easy if you know green's theorem of course you must remember to prove green's theorem you need to have put in a lot of effort and you can't use cauchy's theorem now. so this is essentially what we have proved mm. Uh, we have proved Cauchy's theorem. Here is the theorem. This theorem basically we break up f z into u plus i v. d z is d x plus i d y. Rewrite in terms of real integral. Use Green's theorem, which states, uh, which converts a path integral integral along a curve C into an integral in the region bounded by that curve, where C bounds that region D. Uh, by Cauchy Riemann, in our case, both the integrals turn out to be zero, and that uh, concludes proof of Cauchy's theorem. Mm, uh, now, I want to see some consequences of uh, Cauchy's theorem. Uh, I'll uh, in your syllabus there are three simple and direct consequences of uh, Cauchy's theorem. We will go one at a time. Uh, first consequence is that. Uh, so the consequence is the following let me read out let f be an analytic function in a region r let p and q be two points in r then integral of fz dz is independent of the path from p to q i know just reading it out will not help you much so here is a picture so i have a complex plane here uh, there is a region in the complex plane some r i written here this is a region and there is a uh, analytic function in this region i'll call that f so there is an analytic function in this that means there's a function in this region complex valued function and that function is analytic this much i know then take two points in the region p and q p is one point q is another point and uh, take a path p a q p a q is one path from p to q and this whole path lies within this region that means basically when i go along this path from p to q i have function defined at every point in r so in particular f is defined all along this path any point on this path f is defined at that point and f is analytic also that's what f is analytic over all of r, whole of r so in particular it is analytic along this path that means you take any point on this path f is analytic at that point so let c1 be one curve one path from p to q uh, what uh, the consequence i am talking is if you take another path from p to q so for example here is another path there is other path from p to q along b b is a point on c2 c2 is the Path, second path c1 was first path from p to q 
C2 is the second path from P to Q. So I, I, I'll say extra things like P A Q is the path. You will see why I need this simplification. Uh, P A Q is the path C1. P B Q is the second path. Note, path is from P to Q. That's why you have an arrow mark there. Paths are oriented. P to Q is different from Q to P. Geometrically, both of them look the same. Means you just see a curve. But I told you the path is not just this what you see. It's a function. For example, when you say path from P to Q, f of z, uh, not f, some path, so let's call it p, uh, not p, p is also already used. Uh, some g is a path. So g of 0 is p, g of 1 is q. g is a function from unit interval to this region r such that 0, here is the unit interval somewhere outside, not in this complex plane. g of 0 is p and g of 1 is q and g of 0 0.5 is somewhere here, 0 of 0, 0 0.25 is somewhere here, g of 0 0.75 is somewhere here. So basically, this path is a function from unit interval to this r. So p a q is one path. q a p is not the same path. It's the opposite of the path. It's oriented in the opposite way because then if h is that path q a p, h of 0 is q and h of 1 is p, whereas g of 0 is p and g of 1 is q. There, g and h are different paths. Let g be path p a q and h be path q a p. So I am trying to emphasize and impress upon you that p a q is different from q a p. They are not the same, even though geometrically they look the same. And so I have two, I'll consider two different paths p, uh, from p to q. So p c1 p a q is one path. C2, which is the path PBQ, is another path. So that's what I written. PBQ be another path from path, I'll call it C2 from P to Q in R. Uh, now, you see, what I want to say is I will consider this following path. I'll start at P, I'll go to Q along C1. So that means I'll go PAQ. And now I will. Re trace the path, second path backwards. That means I'll go from Q to P along C2, but minus C2. That means C2 is oriented in this direction, but I'm going to come back in this direction, right? So uh, integ I want to consider this path, P, A, Q, B, back to P. P, A, Q, B, P. Let me repeat it. P A Q along C1, Q B P along C2. So basically in this combined path, uh, when I combine these two paths, I start at P and come back to P. First I go along C1, next I go along minus C2, not C2. I go along C1 and come back along minus C2. So uh, but my f is analytic in the whole region. So in particular, it is analytic in this region, which is bounded by C1 minus C2. Oh, note, C1 minus C2 is a simple closed loop. Correct? It's, a, it's never intersected itself. That's the kind of path I have chosen. And uh, it's a loop. It starts at P, goes to Q somewhere, and comes back to P. So it's a simple closed curve. It's a loop. Uh, F is analytic everywhere inside and on the loop. So Cauchy's theorem says integral along this path is zero. What is integral along this path? It is integral along path C1 plus integral along minus C2. So integral along C1 minus integral along C2 is zero, which means integral along C1 is equal to integral along C2. So here I have written that. So uh, try to, you have to keep in mind uh, since I have only one screen and I can't, I'm not such an expert in this, making these PPTs, I'll have to keep going back, shuttling back and up, uh, forward. So P, A, Q, B, P. Remember this. P, A, Q, B, P. So uh, integral along P, A, Q, B, P is integral along P, A, Q plus Q, B, P. So first path I went along C1, this is C1 and this is 
minus C2. So instead of saying QBP, I can say PBQ in the opposite direction, means in the orientation is reversed. So I will uh, rewrite this integral of FZ DZ over QBP as minus integral of FZ DZ along PBQ. Uh, Cauchy's theorem says this left hand side is zero because in the region bounded by PAQBP and on the PAQB, uh, my function is analytic. So this integral is zero. So if this is zero, this is this difference is zero, which means this is equal to this. So this means, but PAQ is nothing but C1 and PBQ is C2. That's what our convention was. So integral of FZ along C1 is equal to integral of FZ along C2. That is what we have shown. This is the consequence of Cauchy's theorem. So what it says is it doesn't matter which path you take. From P to Q, whichever path you take, whichever path you can take C3, then C1 minus C3 integral of FZ DZ along C1 minus C3 is zero. You can take any path, it doesn't matter. So it, what it says is, what, the upshot of this is, integral of FZ from P to Q is independent of path you choose. Any path you choose, the value of the integral is going to be the same. That's what it says. This is the first and very easy and very powerful consequence. Means this will be used several places, several times. Okay, so this shows that integral is independent of path. Now, consequence two, let me check. Uh, let me tell you uh, what is the second consequence. Uh, it says let C1 and C2 be two simple closed curves such that C2 lies entirely within C1. That means C1, I'll show you a figure, but before I show you a figure, you should try to uh, imagine what I'm saying. C1 and C2 are two simple closed curves. So you must think of two simple closed curves such that C2 lies entirely within C1. That means C1 is one big simple closed curve and C2 is completely inside C1, inside the region bounded by C1. And let F be analytic function in the region, uh, this is typo, it's not a region, in the region between C1 and C2. Then integral of Fz along C1 is same as integral of Fz along C2. You know, this may get a bit abstract now, so let me show you a figure. So here are two simple closed curves C1 is one simple closed curve, which is C1, I'm showing you. Along this, I have drawn a nice ellipse here, but in general, it need not be ellipse. I just want it to be a simple closed curve. This is C1 and this is C2. Note, I have given same orientation for both. Both I have given anti-clockwise. So this is C1, the outside bigger uh, simple closed curve is C1, inside smaller, uh, simple closed curve is C2. Now I want annular region. That means this region which is shaded blue between C1 and C2 that is bounded by, uh, sorry, bounded by C1 but outside C2. So I told you C2 must lie entirely within C1. I don't want it to touch C1 right now. But doesn't matter. Boundary conditions one can always do finer things. But in the first course I will not bother about all those things. So C2 is a simple closed curve completely contained in C1. And in the region bounded between C1 and C2, I want F to be analytic. F is analytic all over where it is blue. You can ask me questions, sir, is it analytic here also? I don't care. It may be analytic, may not be analytic. I, it doesn't matter to me whether it is analytic or not. What matters to me is in the annular region. Uh, I hope you understand what is annular region. Annular region means uh, means it is within C1 but outside C2. Means the region bounded between C1 and C2 is called the annular region. In that annular region, I want uh, C1, uh, I want F to be analytic. That's what my condition is. Uh, if it is so, what the consequence is of Cauchy's theorem is, is that integral along C1 of Fz dz is same as integral of fz dz along c2. That means you can shrink c1 to c2. Gradually you can shrink. You see slowly you can shrink this 
as long the path on which you are shrinking c1 to c2 every point on that path uh, my function must be analytic function is indeed analytic here so uh, along this path if it is analytic path i have not shown here but i hope you understand what i'm saying what i mean to be specific if f is analytic in this annular region then integral of f along c1 is same as integral of f along c2 that is what second consequences how do i prove this a proof of this will involve one construction which is very important in complex analysis please try to follow this carefully what i will do is i will introduce what is known as cuts that means somehow i want to relate c1 and c2 what i will do is i will introduce two cuts uh, what are the two cuts from c1 you pick up any point on c1 uh, p i'll call it p uh, i'll make a cut along that's cut please note this whole cut is in the annular region obviously and pq is a cut from c1 to c2 and sr is a cut from c1 to c2 again i make two cuts basically actually if you take as is if you take this as one sheet this blue thing if you make a cut along pq and rs you will get two different disconnected components that means this will be one part this will be uh, other other one will be another part so uh, so i introduce the cuts make two cuts pq and rs as shown in this figure so c1 is oriented to anti clockwise c2 is also oriented anti clockwise this is a wrong picture this arrow mark should not be there is it um, no i think i made this is okay c1 and c2 both are oriented in the same way okay just stick to that c1 and then after i make cut uh, i have to make some modifications i'm sure that modification is what i have put up on the slide already that's what is maybe confusing a bit so this is what it should be after making cut orient the paths as follows that means i'll start with p i'll go like this like this like this like this you can follow the arrow i'll come to s and then instead of continuing on my path c1 what i will do is i will head towards r and reach c2 and once i reach c2 i will go uh, previously i had oriented c2 counter clockwise but now i will go clockwise that's why this arrow i'm going along this c2 to reach q after i reach q instead of continuing in c2 i will head back to p so let me recall let me show you once more start at p go along c1 on remain on c1 till you reach s then you instead of continuing on c1 you head towards c2 via r and then reverse orientation of c2 that means you come back this way you go in the clockwise direction to q and from q instead of continuing back on c2 i go back to p so i'll get a loop here you see this is a simple closed curve what is a simple closed curve so let's give a name for this uh, names are given here so a is one point on this part and b is one point on this part e is one point on c2 f is one point on c2 at appropriate places so now my path is from p to a to s to r to e to q and back to p you can follow the arrow from p i'll go along c1 i'll reach a continue on c1 reach s and then take a turn towards r and then at r i go towards q via e and then from q i head back to p so p a s r e q p is a simple closed loop simple closed curve you see this part what where how my cursor is moving you have to see that how cursor is moving this is a path it this path is basically a simple closed curve and within that simple closed curve you see f is analytic and also i'll get one more simple closed curve from here from p instead of going towards c1 i'll head towards q p q and then i'll go clockwise to r on c2 via f 
and from R I go to S and from S along B I come to P. So try to understand this is the curve I'm talking. From P to Q to F to R to S to B to back to P. So this is another simple closed curve. This is one simple closed curve. On and inside this simple closed curve, F is analytic. On and inside this simple closed curve, F is analytic. So integral along this is zero. Integral along this is also zero. So integral of sum of these two is also zero. So integral along this plus integral along this. This means, I hope you understand what I'm saying. P, A, S, R, E, Q, P. This along this path, along this closed loop, f is in, uh, integral of f is zero. Along this path, p, q, f, r, s, b, and p. Along that closed path, also integral is zero. So if I add these two integrals, that means integral of f z along this path. You go like this, come back like this, and come back plus. You go like this, come back like this, and come back to P like this. That sum is zero. Now one very beautiful thing happens. What happens? This integral from P to Q, which came in the second loop, is negative of the integral which came in the first integral, which is from Q to P. Similarly, R to S and S to R. They are negative of each other. This we have seen before. If you go from P to Q and Q to P, there one is negative of the other. So uh, I, I'll show you here. So Cauchy's, theor uh, Cauchy's theorem, what it says is each integral is zero. Each integral along this path and this simple closed loop. Both are simple closed curve. Both are zero. So that's what I have written. Cauchy's theorem says that the integral of f along p a s r e q p equals zero also integral of f along p q f r s b p is also zero thus their uh, sum is zero because both the integrals are zero p a s r e q p is the loop the lower loop p q f r s b p is the upper loop their sum is zero now i'll break up these both the integrals into uh, showing so that it shows C1 and C2. Here I have done this. Uh, you can go through, it's not difficult, but to uh, write it in a PPT, it's like pretty painful with so many symbols around. So, 0 is equal to this is what we saw in the last slide fz dz, integral of fz dz over this loop plus integral of fz over this loop. So, this loop I am breaking up into PAS plus SR plus REQ plus QP. If you are not convinced, you can see this. I broke up this full integral along P, A, S, R, E, Q, P as first path, I'll, I'll, that integral is equal to integral of Fz along P, A, S plus integral along S, R plus integral along R, E, Q plus integral along Q, P. Similarly, I'll break up this integral along this P, Q, F, R, S, B, P as integral along P, Q plus integral along Q, F, R plus integral along R, S plus integral along S, B, P. So that is what I have written here. P integral along P, A, S, R, E, Q, P is same as integral along P, A, S plus integral along S, R plus integral along R, E, Q plus integral along Q, P. Similarly, this is Integral along PQ FR SBP is integral along PQ plus integral along QFR plus integral along RS plus integral along SBP. Now, this is the key thing. Uh, you observe that integral along QP, integral of FZ, I will not keep repeating that. Integral along QP is negative of integral along PQ. So these two are negative of each other. The fourth integral and the fifth integral are negative of each other. Similarly, second integral and seventh integral are negative of each other because both are you are integrating the same function along the same path with reverse orientation. Once it is from P to Q, another one. 
another time it is from q to p and in the second integral one sets from s r s to r in the second case you are integrating from r to s so they are negative of each other that means they'll get cancelled this fourth integral and fifth integral will get cancelled second and seventh integral will get cancelled so let's rewrite this uh, so where is that so here i return qp and pq this should be minus this is a uh, wrong uh, I, i'll correct it later this is uh, minus pq and uh, this is minus rs so they will get cancelled so i'll get integral of pas plus integral of sbp here it is i'll put them together pas plus sbp and integral req plus qfr the first and the last integral i'll put together third and the uh, fifth in, sixth integral i'll put them together other four integrals have got cancelled with each other so pas plus sbp let's go to the figure and see what happens pas plus sbp p a s plus s b p is our c1 you see p a s plus s b p that is my integral of fz along c1 similarly this other one will be uh, along this path plus this path that is qfr plus r e q that will be integral along c2 in the opposite direction reverse orientation so here it is i written that so this pas plus sbp is integral along c1 and req plus qfr will be along c2 but in the negative orientation because c2 was oriented in the counter clockwise but right now this is clockwise so this this integral will reduce to integral of fz dz over c1 minus integral of fz dz over c2 and i know i started saying that this is all zero because this integral consisted of integral of fz along two simple closed loops with inside which inside which f was analytic see try to understand this point carefully let me bore you at the risk of boring you let me repeat it i don't know analytic analyticity of f inside this but i know analyticity of f within this blue region and along this loop you have to see my cursor along this loop integral of fz dz is zero because cauchy's theorem says whenever f in the inside this loop if f is analytic integral of f is zero similarly integral inside this loop is zero because f is analytic inside this so i'll add them when i add them i very conveniently this and this gets cancelled this and this gets cancelled so i am left with c1 and minus c2 so integral along c1 minus c2 is zero that's what we have seen so that means integral of c1 is equal to integral of c2 i mean integral of fz along c1 is equal to integral of fz along c2 and the region between c1 and c2 where f is analytic this is the you know, definition which i already told you that region between c1 and c2 is called annular region third consequence is essentially an extension of the second one uh, what happens here in the second consequence what we saw was you had one simple closed curve and within that you had one more simple closed curve and in the annular region f was analytic and we showed that integral along c1 is same as integral along c2 now i want to extend this case extend it means instead of having only one simple closed curve inside i will have many finitely many so i'll show you a figure so here is a simple closed curve c so of course all over here f is defined it's in a complex plane you can see the blue line here which shows its complex plane and c is a, a, a simple closed curve in complex plane and c2 is a simple closed curve enclosed within c c is the outer one c1 is what is inside and c2 is another simple closed curve c3 will be another simple closed curve etc etc you can go up to cn so the finitely many there are there could be n different simple closed loops for time being they are all disjoint means nothing overlaps overlaps what happens we'll see some other time 
So C1, C2, etc., C and etc. They are non-overlapping simple closed loops enclosed within this large simple closed loop. Now I'll orient all of them counterclockwise. That means C is oriented counterclockwise. C1 is oriented counterclockwise. C2 is oriented counterclockwise. Similarly, Cn is oriented counterclockwise. There are many of them, meaning there are finitely many. But in the consequence two was when n was n equal to one. That means there is only one, one simple closed curve inside. Uh, now you do the same trick of cutting. You join, make these cuts from the outside C to C1, C1 to C2, C2 to C3, C3 to C4, etc., etc., etc. Cn minus one to Cn and Cn to C. So you made these cuts joining, basically join uh, two adjacent ones from C1 to uh, C to C1, C1 to C2, C2 to C3, C3 to C4, etc., etc., Cn minus 2 to Cn minus 1, and Cn minus 1 to Cn, and finally Cn back to C. So what is the same argument what I'll give you. So previously I had only one uh, simple closed curve, so I made one cut here. And the other C1 itself was Cn. So I had one final cut from this to this. Now there may be more than one, but that's okay. Now again, I, I'm not going to details. I'm running short of time. I'll be quick here. Again, if you take this path, you must see the uh, arrow uh, cursor mark, how it is going. I'll start here. From here, I'll come like this, like this, like this, like this. I'll reach this cut go towards cn i'll go now you see i'm going clockwise on cn so it is the ulta it's the reverse of what cn was i'll end up at cn minus one then i'll go ulta to go to cn minus two etc 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 i'll come here to c3 and on this side of the uh, simple closed square remember and from here i come to c2 and then i go clockwise on c2 till i reach the other side of the other point of the cut and then i reach c1 and then I go clockwise along C1 and then reach this point where it is cut and come back to this original point. So this is a simple closed curve and it is analytic in this region. Oh, I forgot to tell, F must be analytic in the shaded region. That means in the annular region bounded by C and C1, C2, C3, etc. up to Cn. So F is analytic along this. So integral of fz dz along this path is uh, this simple closed curve is zero by Cauchy's theorem similarly i have one path here you start here come here come like this go along c1 and then along c2 and then you come here uh, all to c3 c4 c5 etc up to then cn and then every time you're traveling on some ck you're tra traveling clockwise and finally you come back along c back to original what you started with so this is another simple closed loop on which uh, on and inside which my f is analytic so this here also it is zero so you add both of them and as usual once you are taking integral along this path and once you are taking along its opposite path so they will get cancelled so all these cuts are basically <coughs> they're Namkavas uh, means they are just for namesake. They really don't. They help us in the proof, but they not. They don't matter. Meaning, what I'm saying is, you can make cut this way also, this way also, whichever way you make. Once you integrate like this, once you integrate like this, so they'll get cancelled. So I'm left with C minus C1 minus C2, etc. Minus Cn. So that integral is zero. Sum of those integrals, each integral is zero. So each. Uh, so I have this integral of fz dz over c is equal to integral of fz dz over c1 plus fz dz over c2 etc up to fz dz over cn. This is an important consequence. So today what we have learned is I think I'm running short of time. The zoom doesn't give more than 40 minutes. Uh, today what we have learned are these three things. F, uh, Cauchy's theorem is what we have learned. If fz is analytic at all points inside and on a simple closed curve then fz dz integral of fz dz along c is zero and under the same condition that means in the region if i i mean uh, f is analytic in some region take two points p and q and then the integral of fz from p to q take any path it doesn't matter along all of them it is same 
and if f is analytic in the annular region then integral of f over c is integral of f z dz over c1 or c2 etc up to cn they are some so we uh, first part we saw only with uh, one uh, two uh, curves uh, sorry first we saw only with one curve c and c1 and i say, extended the proof for when there are finitely many uh, curves uh these are uh, important maybe in the next class we will try to solve one problem we will try to verify cauchy's theorem and also we will try to see uh, one example for example gravitational uh, field uh, when you take uh, potential energy from one point to another point it doesn't depend on change in potential energy doesn't depend on the path it depends only on the initial and final heights so such things are consequences of cauchy's theorem uh i'll stop here today uh, uh i hope uh, this lecture made sense if any of you have any uh, doubts or uh, queries please send me a mail no problem thank you